be especially the ones that claim to be secular. Everybody worships something. So as the United States becomes progressively and now aggressively less Christian, that doesn't mean that religion has disappeared. Easter was replaced just the other day by the Biden administration with the worship of transsexualism, Transvisibility Day. So it's a religion, it's just different. And in this case, it happens to be a pagan religion. And that's the direction the United States is speeding right now toward paganism. The question is, what does that mean? And does it make anybody happier? Very few people have thought about this in any systematic detail. John Daniel Davidson of The Federalist is one who has. In fact, he's written a new book on it called Pagan America, The Decline of Christianity and the Dark Age to Come. And we are happy to have him join us now. John, thanks very much uh, for coming on. Um, so pag Pagan America does a bunch of questions, but does the decline of Christianity, which is demonstrable and obvious and intentional, does that inevitably mean paganism? In a word, yes. Because in the end, there is only one alternative to Christianity, and that is paganism. And and we should be clear about our terms, right? Um, when we say paganism, I don't mean that where there's going to be a sudden resurgence of the worship of Zeus or right. Odin, uh, you know, and and uh, an explosion of witchcraft. Although that is happening as well. Um, yes. What I mean is a return of the pagan ethos, and the pagan ethos uh, is and always has been a rejection of transcendent or objective truth, right? Uh, pagans were free to divinize and assign divine status to the here and now, to things, to natural phenomena, even to people. And we are returning to that as the world becomes re-enchanted from its uh, sort of secular hiatus that, we, that we've been on for the past century or so. And what that means in America, of course, is a radical moral subjectivity that we see in the trans movement, that we see in Black Lives Matter and critical race theory, that we see all across our society asserting itself now that rejects the what are fundamentally Christian claims about the human person, our relationship to one another, and our relationship to God. So it seems like one of the ways, maybe the main way that Christianity is different from all other religions in a, in a practical sense, is that it rejects human sacrifice. Human sacrifice being a constant throughout all recorded history in every non-Christian culture, human sacrifice is at the center. So as Christianity recedes, should it surprise us that abortion, euthanasia, killing, war, human sacrifice has come to the center of our culture? Not at all. In fact, I, I deal with this at length, uh, specifically with abortion and euthanasia as the most obvious manifestations of the return of human sacrifice in the new pagan cults. And it's interesting when you look at the justification for something like abortion, you know, back after Roe v. Wade and, and even into the 1980s, the justification was this isn't a human being. This is just a clump of cells. Um, you're not taking a, a human life and uh, th th these fetuses aren't viable. And as medical technology progressed in the 80s and 90s and, and over the past 25 years, you see the justification change. Advances in medical technology made the original justification uh, make no sense. It could not yes. be uh, maintained that this was just a clump of cells. We all knew and we all know undoubtedly now beyond any doubt, uh, objectively, an unborn human being is a human being. Uh, right. and, and so the justification has changed from it's a clump of cells to safe, legal, and rare to shout your abortion. And so now you have a positive defense of abortion as a as a good, in fact, as a moral good that we should brag about and we should champion. Uh, and that is not a Christian value. That is a pagan value. And it's reasserting itself now in a modern context. Well, I, I have noticed this. I haven't thought it through to the impressive degree that you have, but I noticed that the justification for abortion went from essentially rational Right, so if if the fetus is not a human being, that's no different from an appendectomy, and there's I mean, that, but I don't agree with that, but that is a rational defense of abortion. It's not a big deal because the question of taking life doesn't enter into it. But once you give that up, then what exactly is what is the justification? Is there a justification, publicly declared justification for taking another human life? Well, there is now, and it's very pagan indeed. The justification now is that it is the will of the mother that determines the humanity of the child. So we have abortion laws in this country where a child of the same gestation, two children of the same gestational age in two different states 
One uh, has to be saved if, if born prematurely. All the medical technology, all the ec medical expertise that can be brought to bear to save that child's life must be brought to bear. Same gestational age child born in another state can be killed with impunity. The only thing that determines the humanity of this person is the desire of the mother to have the child or not have the child. And that is also quintessentially pagan because in a pagan society, what determines right, uh, what is morally correct is based on the is based on a power dynamic. Those who have power do what they want to those who have no power. And that is their right. That is their, their, their God given right to enslave or kill or rape or abuse anyone who they have power over. And that's the dynamic we see returning now. It may start with a rational or secular justification as we saw with abortion, but as we're seeing now in places like Canada with euthanasia, it quickly moves uh, into a power dynamic where people who are inconvenient are simply being killed. Uh, and there's very little justification on a moral, on a Christian moral basis for it. Instead, there's, there's a pagan moral justification which is all about power and force and will. And and there's a delight there. I mean, I, you watch the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, who I, I consider a criminal based on crimes that she has committed and never been punished for, but whatever you think of Janet Yellen, her job has nothing to do with abortion. She's the Treasury Secretary. And she comes out sort of in, it's almost like this non sequitur. It's like, well, why are you talking about abortion? And tells us that it's just a good thing. It's just a, it's just a good thing. And if you want to help this country, you'll have more abortions. And she's thrilled to do it. So I look at that and I'm like, there's a supernatural component here. There's got to be because there's no rational justification for it. Yeah, exactly. There's no rational justification to allow healthy young people who are suffering from depression uh, or maybe substance abuse addiction to um, to kill themselves, but to have physician assisted suicide. Right. And yet that's what's happening in, in, in Canada right now. And, and they went down the slippery slope. It only took them a few years to go from only people with terminal illnesses to um, anyone who's depressed and, and lonely. Uh, and maybe maybe also people who are costing the national health system a lot of yes. money. Maybe those people do. We can get rid of them. And there's actually, you know, uh, some government studies in Canada have actually calculated how much the National Health Service will save by expanding their euthanasia program. This is really dark stuff. And, and we have to understand it for what it is. It's the replacing of Christian morality with pagan morality. And, and the transformation of, uh, of a republic of self-governing citizens into what essentially is a slave empire where those with power, the ruling class, rules over an underclass that is subject to, to, to that power. And, and that's a very different dynamic. It means a total transformation right. of American society. And I don't think that many people have really started to wrap their heads around the implications of that for all of us. Well, in, in Canada, I mean, you have the state murdering its own native population, overwhelmingly the Christian population of Canada, people whose ancestors were Christian, churchgoers, and then replacing them with people who, you know, who are not Christians from other countries. So it's it's hard not to see that as as part of it. I mean, that's just a fact. I, I mean, I guess you could interpret it in a different way, but it's it's the Christian Canadians who are getting killed by the state. I think that's just just true. I mean, it was also, you know, we saw with this, um, th this hoax about the mass graves at the indigenous schools as well that unleashed uh, a flurry of violence against Catholic churches in Canada. Dozens of churches were burned down, vandalized, destroyed, and the prime minister encouraged it. He cheered it on. Yes. And it was the same thing with the Black Lives Matter protesters here in the summer of 2020. The regime did nothing. It, they encouraged it. They, they wanted it to happen. Uh, they were willing to countenance violence in the streets and the use, again, the use of raw force to advance their agenda and cement their rule, uh, and then and then unequally apply the force of the state against Christians, against uh, pro-life protesters, uh, against people who were in the vicinity of the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, this is a pattern that we're going to see repeated more and more often as we get away from this idea um, that, uh, of traditional Christian morality that is to say individual rights rule of law consent of the governed these aren't things that just exist in like a secular liberal utopia they depend on an actual christian society to sustain them and when christianity you know declines or becomes we enter into a post-christian era those things are going to go away yeah. like they can't they can't sustain themselves on their own uh and i i don't think that that we appreciate just how much we rely on our Christian inheritance 
for like our specifically American way of life. So uh, I think that's really insightful what you just said, but it's also the opposite of what we were promised. So what we were promised as always was liberation from the strictures of this ancient religion that kept people from dancing and playing cards and having premarital sex and like any kind of fun at all, right? It was the foot, the footloose model. And, but that's not, but what we got was not liberation. The country doesn't seem freer or liberated as compared to the America of 30 years ago. So it, it does seem like it's a lie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it, it is a lie. And, and I think it, there's there's a there's a misunderstanding maybe of, of terms that that has crept into our society as well like when the founders said life liberty and the pursuit of happiness they understood happiness in a very specific way which was the cultivation and the acquisition of virtue right right you, you are free to do, not to do as you as you want to whatever you want to you're free to do as you ought you know this is something uh you know uh john paul ii talked about that that the true meaning of freedom was freeing you to be good, right? And to be virtuous. Uh, it, it wasn't freeing you to, you know, try to change your, your sex and, uh, or, or to, to engage publicly in, in sexual fetishes and, and to try to foist that on children, um, right. or, or to be, you know, an out and out racist. That's not what freedom is for. And so w we see along with a decay of freedom into, into license, right? We also see a disfigurement of reason. And that's also characteristic of pa pagan societies. Reason and faith are complementary. That's what Christians have always believed because it's the truth. Uh, but now we see creeping in uh, a, an abuse of reason. Um, and, and you see this most obviously right in the COVID pandemic where people were invoking science, but making everyone do these completely irrational things that had nothing to do with science uh, and were totally unreasonable. A and you see this justification everywhere now in public life and always it is the we still use the language of science and reason, but clearly what is what is what is the determining factor for the people in power is simply force and will. We are going to make you do this, not because it's reasonable, not because it even works. We're just going to make you do it because we're telling you to do it. And we're going to start to see a lot more of that, too. COVID should have been a real eye opener. And I think it was for some people about what the regime is capable of and how we're sort of operating on a new level, even when it comes to the justifications for major public policy. So, I, I mean, I think this, I think you're exactly right. You know, Christianity has rules, but by its nature, it rarely uses force to impose them on others. Paganism is the opposite. So the first several centuries after Jesus's death, the Romans were in charge. It was a pagan society and they required all subjects to bow down before their gods, to acknowledge their gods. Christians wouldn't and they murder the Christians by the tens of thousands. Then Constantine converts, it becomes a Christian empire, but the Christian empire does not force the non-Christians to bow down before Jesus on pain of death. It allows them to live there, right? So they're like, in other words, Christianity is more, I guess, in the American sense, a little bit more libertarian or much more libertarian, really, than any kind of pagan religious structure. Or am I misreading this? No, you're, you're absolutely right. Tolerance, like religious tolerance is a specifically Christian principle. It exists only in Christian societies and it depends on a Christian worldview. And you have to accept some Christian theological claims about, about the cosmos and about man and God in order to even entertain the idea of something like tolerance or freedom of speech, right? These are luxury goods that only a Christian society can afford, right? right? Because, because Christianity, it does not compel belief, but pagan societies do. Uh, and, and so the idea that we could have like tolerance and we could have freedom of speech and we could have sort of a live and let live libertarianism yeah, exactly. without Christianity is totally false. You actually need a Christian society and a, and a public square that is shaped and formed by Christian moral virtues in order to have tolerance, in order to have freedom of religion and freedom of speech. So, you know, when the founders, uh, when George Washington sent his letter to the Hebrew congregation, you know, what he was saying in part was, we will not impose force on you. We will leave you free to practice your faith because we are a Christian nation. And because we can allow that, we can, we can have tolerance for your, for your beliefs here because we're Christian. We're losing that. And when we lose that, we're going to see force and compulsion and coercion come back into the public square with, with force. 
And, and we're actually seeing that right now. I mean, how much longer are people going to be allowed to be pro-life or to oppose gay marriage or, or even to, you know, uh, insist that, that men are men and women are women? Well, right. Bow down before my tranny God. I mean, that's, that's what they're demanding. Um, it feels like people got this backwards. And I just want to press you a little bit on the, on the question of science. So science flourished in the West and really only in the West, pure science flourished only in the West when it was Christian. And as Christianity recedes and of course under attack and disintegrating in, a, in its institutional form, um, science is going away too. I, I noticed that our leaders don't believe in actual science, in, in empiricism, for example. What's the connection between Christianity and science? Well, it's what we were saying earlier about, you know, that there is no conflict between faith and reason. These are, these are complementary. Right, right. The truth about the physical world is, is revealed by God, but it's also revealed to mankind through our reason, through the faculties that God gave us. We are created in, in the image and likeness of God, and we can apprehend truths about God's creation through our senses and, and through our rational minds, uh, and, and using scientific method using scientific instruments it doesn't mean that the only thing that's true are things that we can measure with our instruments right but the things that we can measure with our instruments are true they are part of god's truth but when you reject the idea of god's truth or the existence of god or even the existence of a of a rational and reasonable uh universe what you're left with again is is just force and will and so there's a we see now uh, a comfortableness on the part of our ruling elite to simply ignore science, to suppress it, to censor it, whenever it contradicts their agenda, especially when it comes to things like the transgender movement, where all of the science and all of the studies that we have point to how harmful and how dangerous it is, and how the people who are, who are suffering essentially from gender dysphoria need help. Um, and, and all of that is being ignored in favor of this radical pagan agenda. It's also is being ignored about social media and screens. We know that those things are harmful. We push them on kids anyway. Uh, so we're going to see this a lot more often too, it, 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 and a disregard for science. And so like appeals to scientific studies and appeals to reason and, and to objectively uh, observable phenomena are going to start to fall on deaf ears because, because a pagan regime uh, really doesn't care about objective truth and, and right. doesn't care about moral objective truth but also doesn't care about scientific objective truth yes it's it's just so interesting and uh, i mean that's a refrain in my own head every day everyone's so unreasonable when do people get so unreasonable like truly unreasonable they just don't care what the established facts are um but i haven't connected it as directly um and as eloquently as you just have to religious faith and it's it's just interesting that everything the reality is exactly the opposite of what we've been promised for the last 40 years which is a secular society will be more tolerant and more reasonable. Religion, Christianity specifically, is the root of division, the root of oppression, um, and the root of superstition, right? It's the opium of the masses. But that the opposite has turned out to be true. Am I misreading this? No, you're right. The opposite is true. I think, uh, you know, we have to take a step back and understand, like, the idea of secularism, of a, of a neutral public space where, where everyone was free to kind of have their own opinions and go their own way. That is a temporary, that was kind of this temporary, like, cesura in the life of Western civilization, made possible by the triumph of Christianity, but reliant on, on Christianity for its, its sustenance, for its vitality. The, the, the thing that we're seeing now is a return to form, right? You either have a, a Christian society and a, and a public square that allows for, you know, secularism and freedom of speech. I mean, secularism, the whole idea of secularism was, was invented by Christianity. So it's, it's a product of Christian civilization. But without that, as Christianity recedes, we're, we're going to return to a different form of society. And that's what I mean when I say there's only two options here. There's, there's the Christian society and there's a pagan society. And it's we're going to go under different names where it's not going to take the same forms as it did in ancient times. But the ethos and the, the cosmological worldview of the ancient pagan world is going to be reconstituted in modern times. And it's going to be very bad. It's going to be the kind of society that not even a, a secular atheist will want to live in. I don't know if you saw the other day, the famous atheist Richard Dawkins in an interview was saying how he's a cultural Christian, he's not a believing Christian, 
And he's upset that there's so much being made in Britain about Ramadan because he thinks Britain should be culturally Christian and he likes cathedrals and he likes the old Christmas carols. And why can't we, why can't we just have that? Well, you can't have that, Richard, if you don't have actual believing Christians who are practicing yeah. the faith. There has to be somebody in the cathedrals that are that is worshiping, somebody who's singing the Christmas carols, who believes the content of the words. Without that, cultural Christianity withers and dies, and something else is going to come in and, and, and replace it uh, if, if you don't have actual Christians living the Christian life in the public square, in your, your nation, and in your community. Well, I don't, I'm a little confused uh, by the leadership of Christian churches in this country, and why there's this reluctance um, to say obvious things that are clearly true and in the interest of the, their congregations and of their faith, um, things that they would be required to say really as Christians. Um, and I'm all, even more deeply confused by, in many cases, the collaboration um, between those churches and a regime that hates them. Wh why have so many Christian leaders just stood by and allowed Joe Biden, for example, to pose as a Christian or people around him to pretend that this isn't really about crushing Christianity, like why not just tell the truth? Uh, yeah, I, I have to, I, as a as a Roman Catholic myself, I have to say I'm I'm dismayed and confused about why Joe Biden hasn't been excommunicated from the Catholic Church by now. Uh, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and many other major political uh, leaders who purport to be Catholic in public, but it, it is very confusing and it's disheartening. I think a lot of Christian leaders in America. Uh, uh, have given have accepted this false notion that winsomeness and being nice is the way to win people over to the faith uh and and not sort of uh you know speaking clearly about about moral truth and i think it's a great mistake because of course the loving thing to do to anyone if you love someone you tell the truth right uh you have to tell them the truth if you love them because you don't want them to persist in a lie that that harms them and damages them so when it comes to an issue like transgenderism the loving thing for christian leaders to do is not to pretend that this is normal or healthy but it's to tell the truth about transgender ideology to save people who may be ensnared in it from from getting involved in it and to help people who are ensnared to get out um, and a willingness to tell the truth has been sorely lacking from our religious leaders across you know denominations in the united states and i think that has to change. We have to grow a spine and our leaders have to uh, get some backbone and be willing to speak the truth, the Christian truth about men and women, about the unborn, about how society should be structured, about marriage, about children, uh, and speak it clearly and unapologetically in love, uh, but, but without caveats. That's, that is loving. That is the way to love people as Christ loved them. And that's also the way to win souls and to convert a, a nation and a people uh, is, is to not apologize for the truth. And, and unfortunately, as you say, we have had a lot of mealy-mouthed, weak Christian leaders in this country who don't know what time it is and who don't realize like what we're talking about, that our society is becoming post-Christian. And in the future pagan order that's coming into being in America, um, you you either speak the truth or you accept the lie. And too many of our Christian leaders are tacitly right now accepting the lies of, of the regime. 